Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 11th of the fourth month, which is finally warm, so I'm very thankful we're getting some sunlight in Washington. It's been quite a while, but it is also June 25th on the Gregorian calendar, and we are continuing our reading of the recognitions of Clement. <clears throat> we're currently on book 10, and we just finished with Kepha having a rather miraculous release of a, a girl that had been demon possessed for a long time. It, it looks like for 20 years or so. And she was actually the daughter of the most influential man, Maro, in the city of where they, I believe it's Laodicea. Laodicea. And Kepha was being asked to stay at his house. And he was refusing because he was enjoined in scripture by our Mashiach himself not to go from place to place, but to stay wherever you, you go to dwell in a city. And it was not until the daughter was released of her demons of, and the doors were opened and she came up and then related the story to him. And then while relating it, the shackles fell off her hands and he knew that this was from Yahuwah, that he agreed to stay there. So he, it's just to show you, he took his word very seriously. It didn't matter that the man was rich and had all these things. He was willing to do what it was written, regardless than to please anyone. And that was the same thing you can see when it was coming to Clement, Asita, and Aquila's mother being immersed before they can eat with her. She needed to fast first. And they tried to come up with ways to say, oh, well, can this count this or that or whatever? And he said, by all means, let's do what's written. We should keep the commandments and not sin. Let's all fast today, and then we can immerse her and she can dine with us tomorrow. And he taught them obedience through the suffering, those things for the truth's sake. It's the same thing here. He doesn't let anything, riches or whatever, sway him. But when he realized it was from Yahuwah, this was ordained, he was not going to argue. And that should be a taught, you know, lesson for all of us just to be, we shouldn't argue with what is, right? Especially the things that happen outside of a man's control. Those things are given from above. And if you love your maker, it is for your benefit. But we're currently on book 10, <clears throat> chapter one, probation. But in the morning, after sunrise, I, Clement, and Nasita, and Aquila, along with Kepha, came to the apartment in which my father and mother were sleeping. And finding them still asleep, we sat down before the door. When Kepha addressed us in such terms as these, Listen to me, most beloved fellow servants. I know that you have great affection for your father. Therefore, I am afraid that you will urge him too soon to take upon himself the yoke of obedience, while he is not yet prepared for it, and to this he may indeed consent, through his affection for you, but this is not to be depended on. For what is done for the sake of men is not worthy of approval and soon falls to pieces. <clears throat> Therefore, it seems to me that you should permit him to live for a year according to his own judgment. And during that time, he may hear with simplicity. And as he hears, if he has any right purpose of acknowledging the truth, he will himself request that he may take the yoke of Torah observant or take up the yoke of Torah observance. Or if he do not please to take it, he may remain a friend. And this is important because the one who even gives a cup of cold water in the name of a taught one shall by no means lose his reward, if you recall. <clears throat> So it's better to be friends with those who are friends of Elohim than enemies of them. And that's what he's trying to cultivate, even if you won't take up obedience to the Torah. 
For those who do not take it up heartily, when they begin not to be able to bear it, cast not, or sorry, not only cast off that which they had taken up, but by way of excuse, as it were, for their weakness, they begin to speak evil of the way of truth and obedience, and to malign those who, whom they have not been able to follow or imitate. <clears throat> To this Nisita answered, My master Kepha, I say nothing against your right and good counsels, but I desire to say one thing, that thereby I may learn something that I do not know. What if my father should die within the year during which you recommend that he should be put off? Will he go down to Gehenna helpless and so be tormented forever? Then said Kepha, I embrace your kindly purpose towards your father, and I forgive you in respect of things in which you are ignorant. For do you suppose that if anyone is thought to have lived righteously, he will forthwith be delivered? Do you not think that he must be examined by him who knows the secrets of men as to how he has lived righteously? whether it be done according to the rule of the nations, obeying their institutions and laws, or for the sake of friendship of men, or merely from custom, or any other cause, or from necessity, and not on account of righteousness itself, and for the sake of Elohim. <clears throat> For those who have lived righteously for the sake of Elohim alone and his righteousness will come to ageless rest, meaning the Malkuth Shemaim, or what we call the millennial reign, the ones who take part of the first resurrection of which there is the second death has no power over them. All right. And will receive the perpetuity of the, the Malkuth Shemaim, or the heavenly kingdom. For deliverance is not obtained by force, but by freedom, and not through the favor of men, but by the belief of Elohim. Then besides, you ought to consider that Yahuwah knows things beforehand, and knows whether this man is one of his. But if he knows that he is not, what will you do with respect to those things that have been determined by him from the beginning? But wherein I can, I give counsel. When he is awake and we sit down together, then do you, as if you desire to learn something, ask a question about those matters that it is small for him to learn. And while we speak to one another, he will gain instruction. But yet, wait first to see if he himself asks anything. For if he does so, the occasion of discourse will be all the more fit. But if he does not ask anything, let us by turns put questions to one another, desiring to learn something. As I have said, such is my judgment. State what is yours. And when we had commended his right counsel, I, Clement, said, In all things, the end for the most part looks back upon the beginning, and the issue of things is similar to the commencement or their commencement. I hope, therefore, with respect to our Father also, since Yahuwah by your means has given a good beginning, that he will bestow also an ending suitable to the beginning and worthy of himself. However, I make this suggestion that if, as you have said, we begin to speak in the presence of my father, as if for the purpose of discussing some subject or learning something from one another, you, my master Kepha, ought not to occupy the place of one who has anything to learn. For if he see this, he will rather be offended for he is convinced that you fully know all things, as indeed you do. How then will it be if he sees you pretending ignorance? This, as I have said, will rather hurt him 
being ignorant of your design. But if we, brothers, while we converse among ourselves, are in any doubt, let a fitting solution be given by you to our inquiry. For if he sees even you hesitating and doubting, then truly he will think that no one has knowledge of the truth. To this Kepha answered, Let us not concern ourselves about this, and if indeed it is fitting for, that he enter the gate of life, Yahuwah will afford a fitting opportunity. And there will be a beginning from Elohim and not from man. And therefore, as I have said, let him journey with us and hear our discussions. But because I saw you in haste, therefore I said that our opportunity must be sought, or that opportunity must be sought. And when Elohim will give it, do you comply with my advice and what I will say? While we were thus talking, a boy came to tell us that our father was now awake, and when we were intending to go in to him, he himself came to us and saluting us with a kiss. After we had sat down again, he said, Is it permitted to ask, or is it permitted to one to ask a question if he desires it? Or is silence enforced after the manner of the Pythagoreans? And if you know Pythagoras was a Greek philosopher, Pythagoreans were Greeks who were following after his particular disposition. So then said Kepha, <clears throat> we do not compel those who come to us either to keep silence continually or to ask questions but we leave them free to do as they will, knowing that he who is anxious about his deliverance, if he feels any pain in any part of his being, does not suffer it to be silent. But he who neglects his deliverance, no advantage is conferred upon him if he is compelled to ask, excepting only this, that he may seem to be in earnest and diligent. If so, if you need an answer to your question, ask on. Then the old man said, <clears throat> There is a saying very prevalent among the Greek philosophers to the effect that there is in reality neither good nor evil in the life of man, but that men call things good or evil as they appear to them, prejudiced by the use and custom of life. For not even murder is really an evil, because it sets free the inner being, or it sets the inner being free from the bonds of the flesh. It says spirit here, but they, this version of the recognitions regularly will put spirit where it should say, or it, it'll put ruach or spirit where it should say soul or nefesh, inner being, right? It says further, they say that even righteous judges put to death those who commit crimes. But if they knew homicide to be an evil, righteous men would not do that. Neither do they say that adultery is an evil. For if the husband does not know or does not care, there is, they say, no evil in it. So you see, they, they take these things and they know that they make it seem wrong. They know that it seems wrong, but they twist it to make it seem like, well, there's no crime if no one is really injured by it, if the injury isn't felt. Or right here, it's not an evil for someone to be murdered because it sets free their inner being. But on the other hand, righteous judges wouldn't put people to death if it was a crime. So they twist that, but a righteous judge is someone who's administering right ruling and there are things that our creator said require death so <clears throat> if he's a righteous judge he's doing what our creator requires and not what men say but moving on it says but neither say they is theft an evil for it takes away what one does not possession from another who has it and indeed 
It ought to be taken freely and openly, but in that it is done secretly, that is rather a reproof of the incompassion from whom it is secretly taken. And you see now they take the victim and make or now they take the victim and make them the responsible party, twisting what right. And that is coming from what they say in Greek philosophy, but really that comes from Satan taking what he enjoins in his word and twisting it to be opposite in men's expectation. For all men ought to have the common use of all things that are in this world, but through injustice or unrighteousness, one says that this is his and another that that is his. And so division is caused among men. In short, a certain man, the wisest among the Greeks, knowing that these things are so, says that friends, haverim is the word for friends, should have all things in common. Now in all things, unquestionably, wives are included. He says also that as the air and the sunshine cannot be divided, so neither ought other things to be divided which are given in this world to all to be possessed in common, but should be so possessed. But I desire to say this because I am desirous to turn to well-doing, and I cannot act well unless I first learn what is good. And if I can comprehend that, I will thereby perceive what is evil, that is opposite to good. But I should like that one of you and not Kepha should answer what I have said, for it is not fitting to take words and instruction at his hand with questions. But when he gives a deliverance on any subject, that should be held without answering again. And therefore let us keep him as an umpire, so that if at any time our discussion does not come to an issue, he may declare what seems good to him and so give an undoubted end to doubtful matters. And now, therefore, I could believe, sorry, and now, therefore, I could believe, content with his sole opinion, if he expressed any opinion, and this is what I will do at last. Yet I desire first to see if it is possible by discussion to find what is sought. My desire, therefore, is that Clement should begin first, and should show if there is any good or evil in substance or in actions. Now, Clement's going to get into trying to explain this using terms of astrology, not because they're true, but because it's something that his father is intimately familiar with. He's becoming, he's speaking in the level that his father can grasp. He will correct anything when it comes to his father believing that these things are so, but he's trying to point out that even in the system that he's familiar with, you can reason out that there is evil in action, okay? And that's the whole premise here. So I don't want you to get mixed up, but he's going to be talking about things that aren't real, and the reason is to explain it to his father. <clears throat> to this I answered, since indeed... You desire to learn from me if there is any good or evil in nature or in act, or whether it is not rather that men, prejudiced by custom, think some things to be good and others to be evil. For as much as they have made a division among themselves of common things, which ought, as you say, to be as common as the air and the sunshine. I think... I ought not to bring before you any statements from any other quarter than those from those studies, or than that, sorry, than from those studies in which you are well versed and that you support, so that what I say you will receive without hesitation. You assign certain boundaries of all the elements and the Shamayim bodies. And these, you say, meet in someone without hurt, as in marriages, but in others they are hurtfully united, 
as in adulteries. And you say that some things are general to all, but other things do not belong to all and are not general. But not to make a long discussion, I will speak briefly of the matter. The earth that is dry is in need of an addition, an admixture of water, that it may be able to produce fruits, without which man cannot live. This is therefore a legitimate conjunction. And real quick, he's giving a discussion in simple terms using a parable of an analogy here that any man can grasp. That is the exact same way without any deviation from how Charles Finney did his preaching and his teaching. He would get a concept and then he would give it and speak in parables or give examples like this in plain language, examples that people could get in the 1800s. And it was, um, it was what caused the revivals, his way of getting men to gr grasp what was intended and then make informed decisions. <clears throat> Just like you see that Clement's father here wanted to do. He wants to comprehend so that he can do the right thing. He says, on the contrary, if the cold of hoarfrost be mixed with the earth or heat with the water, <clears throat> a conjunction of this sort produces corruption, and this in such things is adultery or not a legitimate conjunction. Then my father answered, but as the harmfulness of an inharmonious conjunction of elements or stars is immediately betrayed, so ought also adultery to be immediately shown that it is an evil. Then I, first tell me this, whether, as you yourself have confessed, evils are produced from incongruous and inharmonious mixture. And then, after that, we will inquire into the other matter. Then my father said, The nature of things is as you say, my son. Then I answered, <clears throat> Since then you desire to learn of these things, see how many things there are that no one doubts to be evils. Do you think that a fever, a fire, sedition, the fall of a house, murder, prisons, racks, pains, <clears throat> mournings, and such like are evils? Then said my father, It is true, my son, that these things are evil, and very evil. Or, at all events, whosoever denies that they are evil, let him suffer them. Then I answered, Since therefore I have to deal with one who is skilled in astrological science or knowledge, I will treat the matter with you according to that science, that taking my method from those things with which you are familiar, you may the more readily acquiesce. Listen now, therefore, you confess that those things that we have mentioned are evils, such as fevers, conflagrations, and such like. Now these, according to you, are said to be produced by malignant stars, such as the humid Saturn and the hot Mars. But things contrary to these are produced by benign, benignant stars, such as the temperate Jupiter and the humid Venus. Is it not so? My father answered, it is so, my son, and it cannot be otherwise. You see, he's having a hard time getting over these things, even after it's been proven not to be real. But he's also acknowledging that malignant stars cause evils and benign stars do not, right? Meaning the influences of them are good or bad, respectively. That's the point that Clement's trying to point out. Then he says, then said I, since you say, therefore, that good things are produced by good stars, by Jupiter and Venus, for example, let us see what is produced where any one of the evil stars is mixed with the good. 
and let us comprehend that that is evil. For you lay down that Venus makes marriages, and if she have Jupiter in her configuration, she makes the marriages chaste. <clears throat> but if Jupiter be not regarding, and Mars be present, then you pronounce that the marriages are corrupted by adultery. Then said my father, it is even so. Then I answered, therefore adultery is an evil, seeing that it is committed through the atom mixture of evil stars, and to state it in a word, all things that you say that the good stars suffer from the mixture of evil stars are undoubtedly to be pronounced to be evil. Those stars, therefore, by whose atom mixture we have said that fevers, conf or configurations, and other such like evils are produced, those, according to you, work also murders, adulteries, thefts, and also produce haunty and stolid men. <clears throat> then my father said, Truly you have shown briefly and incomparably that there are evils in actions. But still I should desire to learn this, how Elohim justly or righteously judges those who sin, as you say, if Genesis compels them to, compels them to sin. So you see, Clement was using the examples to get the analogy out, but his father missed the point, and he's, he's thinking that he's trying to say that those are legitimate. But right here, Clement's about to correct that. <clears throat> then I answered, I am afraid to speak anything to you, my father, because it becomes me to hold you in all honor. Else I have an answer to give you, if it were becoming. Then says my father, Speak what occurs to you, my son, for it is not you, but the method of inquiry, that does the wrong as a modest woman to be, or to an incontinent man, if she is indignant for her safety and her honor. Then I answered, If we do not hold by the principles that we have acknowledged and confessed, but if those things that have been defined are always loosened by forgetfulness, we will seem to be weaving Penelope's web, undoing what we have done. And therefore, we ought either not to acquiesce too easily before we have diligently examined the doctrine propounded, or if we have once acquiesced and the proposition has been agreed to, then we ought to keep by what has been once determined, that we may go on with our inquiries respecting other matters. And all that was to say, if you've already been shown and it's been proven that Genesis or astrology isn't real, you can't keep going back to it like it's legitimate, right? And my father said, you say, well, my son, and I know why you say this. It is because in the discussion yesterday on natural causes, you showed that some malignant power transferring itself into the order of the stars excites the lusts of men, provoking them in various ways to sin, yet not compelling or producing sins. To this I answered, it is well that you remember it, and yet, see, right here, this is the secret. This is the reason why the Gregorian calendar is key to the stars, and witchcraft is very studious about astrology, about where the stars are and when. Because, right here, a malignant power, Satan, Mastema, right, transferring itself into the order of the stars, excites the lusts of men, provoking them in various ways to sin, yet not compelling or producing sins. And anyone who reads about astrology or gets their horoscope or things of that nature has a demon in them producing these lusts in that very fashion to confirm the lie. That's why if you listen to John Todd's witnessing about it, 
He says you have to repent from it. You need to get prayed for to have those demons cast out of you because it's automatic. That kind of stuff is, is witchcraft and the whole purpose is to delude you. To make you believe that it's real and to go ahead and capitulate to it. But he says, to this I answered, <clears throat> it is well that you remember it and yet though you do remember it, you have fallen into error. Then said my father, pardon me, my son, for I have not yet much practice in these things. For indeed your discourse is yesterday, by their truth shut me up to agree with you. Yet in my consciousness there are, as it were, some remains of fevers, which for a little hold me back from belief as from health. For I am distracted because I know that many things Yes, almost all things have befallen me according to Genesis. Then I answered, I will therefore tell you, my father, what is the nature of mathematics? And this is what he means by astrology, okay? And do you act according to what I tell you? Go to a mathematician. And tell him first that such and such evils have befallen you at such a time, and that you desire to learn of him whence and or how, or through what stars they have befallen you. He will no doubt answer you that a malignant Mars or Saturn has ruled your times, or that someone of them has been periodic, or that someone has regarded you diametrically, or in conjunction, or centrally, or some such answer will he give, adding that in all these someone was not in harmony with the malignant one, or was invisible, or was in the figure, or was beyond the division, or was eclipsed, or was not in contact, or was among the dark stars, and many other like things will he answer according to his own reasons, and will condescend upon particulars. After him, go to another mathematician, and tell him the opposite, that such and such good came to you at that time, mentioning to him the same time, and ask him from what parts of your genesis this good has come to you. And take care, as I said, that the times are the same with those about which you asked concerning the evils. And when you have deceived him concerning the times, see what figures he will invent for you, by which to show that good things ought to have befallen you at those very times. For it is impossible for those treating to the genesis of men not to find in every quarter, as they call it, of the heavenly bodies, some stars favorably placed and some unfavorably, for the circle is equally complete in every part. According to mathematics, admitting of diverse and various causes, from which they can take occasion of saying whatever they please. For as usually is the case when the slow of comprehending see unfavorable dreams and can make nothing certain out of them. When any event occurs, then they adopt what they saw in the dream to what has occurred. And also is mathematics, or so also is mathematics. For before anything is passed, nothing is declared with certainty. But afterwards, they gathered the causes of the event. And thus often, when they have been at fault, and the thing has fallen out otherwise, they take the blame to themselves, saying that it was such and such a star that opposed, and that they did not see it. Not knowing that their error does not proceed from their unskillfulness in, the, in their art, but from the inconsistency of the whole system. They do not know what those things are that we indeed desire to do, but in regard to which we do 
not indulge our desires. But we who have learned the reason of this mystery know the cause, since having freedom of will, we sometimes oppose our desires and sometimes yield to them. And therefore the issue of man's doings is uncertain because it depends upon freedom of will. For a mathematician can indeed indicate the desire that a malignant power produces, meaning the system that the watcher set up isn't inaccurate because they can, it's a fake system. They can, it's a mockery of what's true. And it's a usurpation of what our creator has established, if you can, if you think about it that way. It's the same thing with witchcraft. It's another way of looking at it. You have on, our creator side, his chosen people, and within those people, a remnant, and that remnant being endowed with his Ruach and having power from on high. It's the flip side on this one. You have the mass of, of mankind who's in that kingdom, and of them, there's a select remnant that does his desire more studiously, and it's all these sick, abominable things contrary to what's good and right. And for doing so, you get his Ruach and power, which is what we call witchcraft. This is, but whether the acting or the issue of this desire will be fulfilled or not, no one can know before the accomplishment of the thing, because it depends upon freedom of will. And this is why ignorant astrologers have invented to themselves the talk about climatrics, or yeah, climatrics, as their refuge in uncertainties, as we showed fully yesterday. If you have anything that you desire to say to this, say on. Then, my father, nothing can be more true, my son, than what you have stated. And while we were thus speaking among ourselves, someone informed us that a great multitude of people were standing outside and having assembled for the purpose of hearing. Then Kepha ordered them to be admitted, for the place was large and convenient. And when we had come, sorry, and when they had come in, Kepha said to us, If any one of you desires, let him address the people and discourse concerning idolatry. To whom I, Clement, answered, your great benignity and gentleness and patience towards all encourages us so that we dare speak in your presence and ask what we please. And therefore, as I said, the gentleness of your disposition invites and encourages all to undertake the precepts of delivering doctrine. This I never saw before in anyone else but in you only, with whom there is neither envy nor indignation. Or what do you think? And here's an important, Kepha gently rebukes the idea that he has all knowledge to both Clement and his father here. But then Kepha said, These things come not only from envy or indignation, but sometimes there is bashfulness in some persons, fearing that they may not be able to answer fully the questions that they that may be proposed. And so they avoid the discovery of their want of skill. But no one ought to be ashamed of this, be because there is no man who ought to profess that he knows all things. For there is only one who knows all things, even he who also made all things. And this isn't speaking of our Mashiach, but the Father, because he talks about it, the Mashiach right here. For if our master declared that he knew not the day nor the hour whose signs even he foretold and referred the whole to the Father, how will we account it dishonorable to confess that we are ignorant of some things, since in this we have the example of our master? But this only we profess, that we know those things that we have learned from the true foreteller, and those things that have been delivered to us by the true foreteller, 
which he judged to be sufficient for man's knowledge. <clears throat> then I, Clement, went on to speak thus at Tripoli's, when you were disputing against the Goyim, or nations, my master Kepha, I greatly wondered at you, that although you were instructed by your father according to the fashion of the Hebrews, and in the observances of your own Torah, and were never polluted by the study of the Greek learning, sorry, of Greek learning, you argued so magnificently and so incomparably, and that you even touched upon some things concerning the histories of those fallen mighty ones, which are usually declaimed in the theaters. But as I perceived that their fables and blasphemies are not so well known to you, I will discourse upon these things in your hearing, repeating them from the very beginning, if it pleases you. Then says Kepha, say on, you do well to assist my preaching. Then said I, I will speak therefore because you order me, not by way of teaching you, but of making public what foolish opinions the nations entertain of false mighty ones. And here he's going to go into a lot of detail about the, the fables of the Greeks and the things in particular that their main false mighty one does. That's abominable characteristics for men. <clears throat> so I apologize in advance. This kind of thing was done because the Greeks were steeped in this and they worshipped things that made them do abominable things without thinking. If you remember Psalm 115, Psalm 135, the Hokma or wisdom of Shalomo goes into, there's a few chapters about the foolishness of idolatry mentions it in Yahu also, Yeshiyahu, I believe, um, the extra writings of Yahu as well. There's a whole epistle on idolatry and to turn away from it, in particular about the people when they went into Babylon, which was literal Babylon then, who worshipped Baal as an idol and a dragon, and then mystery Babylon later, which we know as Catholicism, which is steeped in idolatry. And literally, it was given its great power by Satan, as foretold in Revelation. But it says, But when I was about to speak, Nasita, biting his lip, beckoned to me to be silent. And when Kepha saw him, he said, Why would you repress his liberal disposition and noble nature, that you would have him be silent for my honor, which is nothing? Or do you not know that if all tribes, after they have heard from me the preaching of the truth and have believed, would betake themselves to teaching, they would gain the greater esteem for me, if indeed you think me desirous of esteem? For what is so honorable as to prepare taught ones for Mashiach, who, not who will be silent and will be delivered alone, but who will speak what they have learned and will do good to others. I desire indeed that both you, Nasita, and you, beloved Aquila, would aid me in preaching the word of Elohim, and the rather because those things in which the nations err are well known to you, and not only you, <clears throat> but all who hear me. I desire, as I have said, so to hear and to learn, that they may be able also to teach. Which is why he, he says in his epistle, always have an answer for the reason, for the expectation that is in you. Right? Always be able to help others know why you hold to this truth, why you will not do what is wrong in the eyes of your maker, because you hold to an eternal existence of unspeakable good things that you you strive to be a part of because you love him. This is for the world needs many helpers by whom men may be recalled from error. Our Mashiach said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, right? <clears throat> when he had thus spoken, he said to me, go on then, Clement, with what you have begun. 
I immediately rejoined, Seeing that when you were disputing at Tripoli's, as I said, you discoursed much concerning the mighty ones of the nations profitably and convincingly, I desire to set forth in your presence the ridiculous legends concerning their origin, both that you may not be unacquainted with the falsehood of this vain superstition, and that the hearers who are present may know the dishonorable character of their error. The wise men, then, who are among the, the nations, say that, first of all, things were, was chaos. And that this, through a long time, solidifying its outer parts, made bonds to itself, and a sort of foundation being gathered, as it were, into the manner and form of a huge egg, within which, in the course of a long time, as within the shell of an egg, there was cherished and vivified a certain animal, and that afterwards, that huge globe being broken, meaning the egg, there came forth a certain kind of man of double sex, which they call masculo-feminine, or a male-female, right? A he-she. Now, right here, you got the tenets of, if you're paying attention, you got the tenets right here of Gnosticism or the occult order out of chaos right there beginning with demons teaching men philosophy from the greeks which if you've been paying attention we haven't gone over it in detail but the greeks were a mixture of yefeth and hebrews that had migrated out of egypt while the others were in captivity And now you get all the symbology with the satanic symbolism, with the goat, male, female symbols and all that. It all ties back to the error that's contrary to what's true and the secret occult knowledge that they believe in. This is this they called fintas from appearing because when it appeared, they say, and then also light shone forth. And from this they say, which is blasphemy, right? They say that there were produced substance, prudence, motion, and coming together, from these the skies and the earth were made. From the Shemaim, they say that six males were produced, whom they call titans, and in like manner, from the earth six females, whom they call titanades. And these are the names of the males who sprang from the, the heaven, or Shemaim, Oceanus, Seos, Creos, Hyperion, or Hy yeah, Hyperion, Hypatis, I don't know if I said that right, and Kronos, who amongst us is called Saturn. In like manner, the in men, these are mentioned in different ways and repudiated in ref, in the revelations in the book of revelation rather just like the idols of egypt were repudiated in the judgments that our creator put upon the egyptians all throughout revelation you have the judgments of our creator against those who were rising up against him and his will and he was rebuking them for the trinity and for the different things that they were doing in the very judgments he sent against them so it's something to pay attention to. Kronos is explicitly said to be no more at the time of Wycliffe. So something to look into more when you can find out information on that from the Antichrist for Dummies videos on YouTube. Something else we talked about quite a bit. It says, in like manner, the names of the females who sprang from the earth are these. Thea, Rhea, Themis, Menomis, uh, Menosine, sorry, Tethys, and Hebe, Hebe. I'm not saying that right. I apologize. <clears throat> All right. Family of Saturn. 
Of all these, the firstborn of heaven took to wife the firstborn of earth, the second, the second, and in like manner all the rest. The first male, therefore, who had married the first female, was on her account drawn downwards, but the second female rose upwards by reason of him to whom she was married. And so each doing in their order remained in those places that fell to their share by the Neptunal lot. From their intercourse they assert that innumerable others sprang. But of these six males, the one who is called Saturn received in marriage Rhea, and having been warned by a certain oracle, that he who should be born of her should be more powerful than himself, and should drive him from his kingdom, he determined to devour all the sons that should be born to him. First, then, there is born to him a son called Hades, who amongst us is called Orcus. And if any of you are familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, a role-playing game that involves magic and other things they have these demons that are named you talk about them you name them you call them on your in your game time playing like it's a joke but it, it's not these things are quite real and it's not something that we should play around with is it who amongst us is called orcus and him for the reason we have just stated he took and devoured teaching us that we should give up our firstborn, not, not who opens the womb should be set apart unto Yahuwah, but sacrifice to Moloch, right? After him, he begot a second son called Neptune, and him he devoured in like manner. Last of all, he begot him whom they call Jupiter, but him his mother Rhea pitying, by stratagem withdrew from his father when he was about to devour him. And first indeed, that the crying of the child might not be noticed, she made cert certain crying banties stroke, or strike cymbals and drums, that by the deafening sound, the crying of the infant might not be heard. But when he understood or comprehended from the lessening of her belly, that her child was born, he demanded it, that he might devour it. Then Rhea presented him with a large stone, and told him that what that was what she had brought forth. And he took it, and swallowed it, and the stone, when it was devoured, pushed and drove forth those sons whom he had formerly swallowed. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions going on. There's a lot of things about you can see in antiquity. And if you look, monarchs throughout the medieval times would have a ball in their hand. A lot of people say, well, that was supposed to be the globe earth that they were controlling the world and whatnot. But that's not actually where it stems from originally. Alexander Hislop in his book for the two Babylons mentions that the large stone that's worshipped by these pagans it came from this story, the liberator of the mighty ones. And, and that was worshipped in that capacity. And that's what's held by monarchs through the ages. They, they push it for the globe thing as well now. But that's just twisting what was originally there. I found that to be rather fascinating. I'm sure there's more to it we can think about. But I just want to let you know. This is therefore Orcus coming forth first descended and occupies the lower, that is, the infernal regions. The second being above him, he whom they called Neptune, is thrust forth upon the waters. The third, who survived by the artifice of his mother Rhea, she put upon a she-goat and sent into the Shamayim. And it's our Mashiach that would write upon a she-goat, right? These stories were all happening. If you, There's constant blasphemy and there's constant mixing of what is in reality with perversion. And that was intentional because he, he hates the truth. 
and he delivered to men a whole bunch of things that took the truth and perverted it, but gave them ideas of what to look for. This is why when our Mashiach came, the Greeks were easily accepting of him because they had all these perversions, and then they were hearing the truth for the first time. It was like, ah, that's what they've been waiting for, right? But literally, these, these mythology stories are just different things from what was foretold about our creator with Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, mixed with blasphemy and error to, to, to get men to believe contrary to the truth. And right here, we're about to see the things that their main mighty one used to do, which if you recall, these are the things that came straight from the giants from the fallen messengers and the giants after them, the things that they did, how they were able to change and whatnot. Um, we didn't read it on a recording, but I'll mention it right now for everyone's benefit. If you look at the homilies, the Clementine homilies are another writing that's like the recognitions, but doesn't always follow the same information. It's kind of like Kings and Chronicles, but I haven't read that one as in depth, so I can't say for certain whether it's all legitimate in one section of it where they're talking about the times of the watchers and what they did he mentions that they came down they were of a more l-like substance and able to change into whatever whatever forms they wanted including objects and what you read about what jupiter does here is exactly what all of these fallen messengers were able to do and were doing and these are the stories that were picked up by their children and are given to men through them as their demons now. These are all explained in the book of Hanok, Yobelim, and other places. May I interject here for a moment? Certainly, brother. Go uh, ahead. We're given, a commission. we're given a commission not to speak of these things. Why are we covering them? Not to I... even mention the names Ah, right. Now, this is the context for that, and that's a good question, because we're not supposed to have the names of false mighty ones in our mouth. We're not supposed to worship or venerate them. They're they're literally nothing. And this is what's explained by, by Shaul to an idol is nothing. These names have no power. It's like Satan. Satan has no power over anyone unless you give him jurisdiction. He's like a chained dog that, with a rabid dog, but on a chain. He can only go within the limits that he's permitted. The same thing is with these demons. They can't mess with you unless you call them up to you. And if you have any fear of them, any idea that there's a legitimate reason to be, venerate the name or to be worried of them or to think that there's some, if you call them, then you have to watch out. That's why he says, don't let it even be in your mouth because it, his children were a superstitious lot that had troubles holding to what was true if that makes sense to you right here he's teaching and you'll see in throughout scripture they call on those mighty ones you have to read them you're going to read their names although throughout the scriptures there's a the word mocks them molech for example i don't know if that was actually the name they called them for those that worshiped him but they say that molech in hebrew is melech with the vowels for shame it's the shameful king, which people would worship. And that king worship carried all the way down to, into the Caesars. That was part of the mystery religion Babylon thing, which is why you have, again, culminating in the little horn office of the Bishop of Rome. Um, the uh, being like Elohim and having men worship him as the king of kings. And they actually call him the... L-O-R-D-G-O-D, -O -D, the Baal Gad, if you will. That's not our maker. They're calling on there, right? So that's the kind of thing we're not to, supposed to be doing. I absolutely agree with that. I don't like calling on their names either. I'm reading it because it's in the text the same way I read what's in, the, what's in Scripture. Um, but in reality, these people are nothing. What they did, what they what they carry down has caused nothing but problems. And there's a lot of the mixture. If you if you really look into it, I can't remember what book it is, but in the anti-Nicene or yeah, in the anti-Nicene patriarchs writings, the 10 volume set 
of the 300 years before the Council of Nicaea. In there, they mentioned that the Greeks, they, the ones that were Hebrews, were ones that mixed, like Saturn, for example, was Yaakov. Jupiter was Yahuda. And those were perversions that they carried over. Hercules was Samson. So those things are, we have to acknowledge that they happen, turn away from it and not do it, and then give absolutely no credence to these things. Another one like right here, Vulcan, where we get volcano, Vulcan comes from two Balkane, who taught metalworking before the flood. And he got that from demons. From messengers, if you remember, Azazel was the one that taught that to men, right? So these are, it's not directly said anywhere, but you can piece them together. These are the things that we're learning, but that, if you're uncomfortable, I'll skip saying the names because I don't mind. However, there is no power inherent in these things outside of what people put to them. It's the very same way, and I, this is the last example I give. In the Apostolic Constitutions, <clears throat> it in the heresy section of it, when it's talking about how it's dangerous to just believe willy-nilly what you will, they're going into detail about a woman who, if she believes when she's in her cycle that she's separated from the Ruach and she can't pray or she can't do certain things and she dies like that, she'll die void of the Ruach. That's a very dangerous thing to do. And it's all because you just believe poorly. So if you can't separate from yourself that these are meaningless, of no value, there's no power behind them, there's demons that can instigate things at the will of your giving them jurisdiction over you. If you, if you know that, it, then by all means, you, you do what he said, right? You don't call on these things to invoke any power. But you can read it when he's when he's like right here. Clement wasn't doing anything wrong. He was literally before Kepha, preaching and before Greeks, but speaking to them about things they were familiar with to try to refute it. If he had been wrong in that, Kepha would have corrected him, right? Commenting. Oh, I know, and I I agree with it. I had those very issues before. There, I used to be very very stickler and. This is one thing that, that scripture is very clear on. As you believe, let it be to you. And he who doubts sins. If you do anything without belief, it's sin. So if your conscience tells you, I don't know about that, don't do it. And that's why if a believer for the conscience of another should abstain from eating in a place or eating certain foods just because they are uncomfortable with it. Right? It's for the, the uh, it's for love's sake. Yeah, the the psychologists, the social uh, people who study the brain, tell us that uh, the imagination is as powerful as the reality. If you tell a person to eat ice cream and they got them all hooked up because ice cream is your favorite or good, brings pleasure, your brain will shoot off little pleasure things. And if you uh, take it away and then don't give it to them that it'll shoot off other things, which are negative. And then just tell them to think about eating ice cream and if they have the same positive effect, it'll shoot off the little parts. So our imagination must be kept under control. Absolutely, that, that was a very good analogy. I haven't thought about it like that before, but that's absolutely true. You have the same thing with dogs. I mean, not, not to equate it that way, but that's how you train a dog. If you use like a computer and treats when they do something and then you give them, you know, you click and give them a treat, click and give them a treat. Eventually you can get it where you can just click and they get that same effect like they got the treat. Or you could do the good boy and pat them on the head or give them a pet or whatever. You can condition them to just receive the one and they'll get the benefit of having the both. They'll get the same effect like they got it. So it is a rather interesting thing. And we can do the same thing to ourselves. That's why it says, Bad company corrupts good habits, right? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I think we're almost 
Yeah, we have yeah. a little bit of time. I don't know if you guys want to get into this too far. We can start reading now and then get back to it next week. Or do you want to talk about what we read and then get into this next time where it's all in one clip? Because it is quite a bit of a discourse here about the Greek. I would note. rather uh, end on a real positive note myself. All right. Uh, I find that better for sleeping at night or in a conversation. If it gets heated, I still want to end on something positive. Yeah. So we might we might back that up and start right here next time so we can have it all in one. And then we can remember remember here. They had reunited with their father, had early. He still has some remnants of, like you said, fevers in him from the things that he's held to for a very, very long time. So it's not because he wants to doubt, but it's the situation that he finds himself in, but he's acknowledging it. So uh, that's a great way to end, I think, for now. Does anyone have any comments or questions before we stop the recording? All right. Well, everyone that's listening, you all have a wonderful week and uh, restful Shabbat. We will see you next time. Shalom.